everybody. Good evening. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, I mean, every week things happen. This week on Earth here, there was a terrible earthquake in Turkey. You know, it looks like 10,000 people are, have died in that quake. And yet the question is, are those things always going to happen? And what can we do as human beings to deal with that? To deal with that, we just don't know. We don't know when our life, our physical body is going to no longer be available to us, where it's going to be crushed or into the ocean or no longer viable as a working entity. So what does that mean? But what do we know? What we do know is that we're alive now and we're alive now and we're alive now and we're alive now. So how can we come into that experience of knowing the now and knowing the experience of the infinite and the love now. And so, you know, people were talking to me this week about the fear of death. And I said, really what people are afraid of, they don't know what it is to live. Because if you're living every moment and living in love every moment, then you're living, you're living, and then when death comes, then death comes, and so be it. So for all of us, what we really need to experience is that experience of love, that experience of the, the perfection of all living things, the perfection of God, or however you would describe it. And we need to know it now, and now, and now, and now. And so for all of us, the time is now to go deep into what, in whatever way, whatever path, whatever tools we have been given to really know the truth of our own lives. We can't afford to wait anymore. There is too much that needs to be done. There is too much for us to come together in that collaboration, in that collaboration here on Earth to really bring into fruition all the love and inspiration that we know is there. Whatever we think separates us, whatever race, religion, color, creed, height, weight, a sexual preference, where you live, what team you root for, it's time that that ended. And what we need to experience, just go deeper than that. And we're all from that same love. We're all made of that same energy. And for all of us, that's what we need to go into, to go more and more into that experience. And as we all know, that's what the show Bridging Heaven and Earth is about. No, no denomination, no specific spiritual path, but, the, but we all need to experience that love and that oneness. And tonight, our guests, once again, exemplify that. They do it in different ways. Some do it through books, some do it through music. But the experience of that one, the experience of that love, is that's what their lives are about, and that's what they hope to share with you tonight. We have Kenneth Becknell with us, who is a spiritual teacher, and is the author of two extraordinary uh, new books, Simon Said and Simon Said Too. And we're just delighted. Uh, Ken came in from Cincinnati just to do the Bridging Heaven and Earth show. Uh, he's been staying at my house, and it's just been a delightful time to, to come across another being whose dedication and, and, and desire to share that experience and to learn more and to be in that experience more is just an inspiration to me. And we also have the inspirational world music group, Mantram, who's just music is, is just heavenly and celestial. And if we can just settle into their music, we can for that period of time at least experience that love and that oneness. So please join with us tonight in, in that experience, in that desire, in that dedication, and in that inspiration. So as we normally do at this time, just to set a tone for the show, please join me in a short meditation and then we'll begin with mantra. So please join me. Okay, we're going to begin tonight's show with the first mantra set. Uh, they're going to do two pieces, uh, the Gayatri Mantra and Sri Ganesha, and it's going to be performed by the, the four extraordinary musicians and toners and chanters of mantra. So whenever we're ready, mantra, please.
Thank you, Manchman. That was beautiful. Thank you. So we're on the set with Ken. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. So why don't you talk about how you came to write Simon Said and, you know, what moved you to do that, you know, and how, you know, the response has been so fantastic. But how did you first come to do that? It essentially came 
by realizing how many books I had to read to get to the point that I was at the time with spirituality, which as you know is composed of a number of different subjects. So I thought that someone should have put all these th thoughts together and I decided that I could, so I did. So you'd be the one to do it? Well, one of the ones that right. do it. I'm sure others have. Right. I'm not familiar with them, but I wanted to have a book put together that would give everyone the opportunity in one book to read about the various aspects of spirituality without having to go through many. Mm -hmm. and so if you, if you had to like, you know, go through and list like the things that would bring someone into that experience of love, of truth, how, how would you, you know, help people do that? What would be your way to... As you know, spirituality has a lot of aspects to it and many subjects such as reincarnation, uh, chakras, are all part of it. What spirituality is, is you know, more of a mindset. It's an attitude, a sense of belonging and being, cooperation, harmony with others. And that is only experienced through living. But in course of living, the, the experiences that I think everyone goes through Childhood, obviously, is the beginning. Uh, that particular occupation will bring on other experiences. And in course of all this, we learn to deal with life in different ways. Spirituality, people that are into spirituality have that attitude, if you will, seem to deal with it a little bit better because they accept things as they happen and recognize them as lessons instead of bad luck or life being unfair to them. They just recognize that there's a learning opportunity to be had there. And to learn what? To learn whatever it happens to be for that individual at the time. May it, it may be patience, it may be cooperation. Uh, teamwork is very important, as you know. Mm -hmm. And they can take these experiences and apply them, and eventually it becomes wisdom in the later years as mm -hmm. we look back on it. and realize how much we've learned and how we have applied what we have learned. So how would the Simon Said book as the first book, now how did that lead people into that? What was the, the major tenets? What were the uh, precepts of that that would allow people to come more into that experience? I think in the beginning it's for them to first understand what spirituality is, if it can be truly defined. Uh, it's not religion per se, even though I think that's the first thing that people hear about. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of various aspects. It is psychology, it has sociology, it has metaphysics. And in course of all this, it obviously branches out into other aspects. As reincarnation, for example, the reincarnation could be valid, it could not. However, there are, may, there are maybe four major theories on reincarnation, which I talk about. And people use reincarnation as a motivator, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And if that is propelling them to become better people, I wish everyone would believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And that's really what life is all about. And that's when life becomes really more fulfilling is when they work toward harmony and cooperation with others because teamwork is the the instrumental part of us as a species making to learn it. how to collaborate without ego and things like exactly that. exactly right so and how do people learn how to do that what I mean do you have like tools in the book or techniques or paths or you just present them in that way I present them as probably the best word because you cannot force somebody to do in, anything. in your own experience what have been the the major influences on you to come into that experience um, really, when I found out that putting ego aside, then in working, not so much for my good, but for the good of the whole, that's when really life started taking on new meaning and the harmony and energy that is associated with that. Uh, one small example would be to volunteer my time for houses, for habit, Habitats for Humanity. Mm -hmm. and to come away at the end of the day with this energy when I should be exhausted from working all day, but the energy of working together unselfishly, mm -hmm. I realized that I was, I was on to something. And 
spirituality is that by definition, working unselfishly. Living unselfishly. Exactly. So, and then what, what, now the theme of Simon Said is that you met somebody named Simon in Yosemite? In, in Yosemite National Park. So why don't you describe that a little? What made you, you know, take that tact on it? Well, it's easier when you, you're, it's a student teacher environment. And Simon has many experiences and knows many things. Kenneth, on the other hand, was quite a novice. And Simon started introducing him to the spirituality and how it applies to life in ways that we, I wouldn't think most people actually realize it. Uh, one of the things in spirituality is known as the law of repetition, which simply put is you will continue to make the same mistakes over and over until you learn the underlying lesson and stop doing it or correct it, take a different action. The best action is in many, many times the case. And there, there are others, uh, why we attract certain people to ourselves, energies and how energies are used. And the underlying theme, once again, is to more or less just take life less seriously in some ways and to recognize... Take yourself less seriously. That's what we Well, that, that, and see everything as a learning opportunity as opposed to good and bad luck, because what can be considered good luck may be bad, insofar as you're not really learning and you're not really helping others. And you're not growing <clears throat> in, in exactly. your... Uh -huh. Because we are thinking, growing beings, if you will, and that's really... We come into the world not knowing anything and not self-sufficient, so we always need one another to help us to the next step. And that's what Simon was to Kenneth, the next step, to take him and expose him to things he hadn't considered, perhaps, and to explain things in a way that was new to him. And so, what what prompted you to write Simon Said too? that there was just more information that needed to come out or the time was right for that? Uh, Simon Said too was based primarily on the Urantia book and it was to essentially go to the next level, to explain things that people have always wondered about for thousands of years, literally, uh, where we came from, why we hear what happens when we die. And there's also many things in Earth's history that have influenced mankind as a whole, Lucifer Rebellion, Adam and Eve, uh, obviously Jesus, and those things are all covered in Simon Said too. At uh, SimonSaid.com, I have put together an outline so people can see the flow and how it all takes place in the course of Earth's history. Mm -hmm. So, why don't you answer those questions? I'm sure our viewers would like to know the answers. You know, if you could, and you know, we have some time. It's you know, uh, an hour show. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, where we came from, Darwin had it correct. However, Darwin lacked insight to what started it, and he didn't take mutations, for example, into consideration, hence the missing link. And as man had evolved to a point, the, the universe, the, everything is a learning process. <clears throat> and the universe will actually send teachers to a planet and take us to the next level. The, Lu the Lucifer Rebellion represented one of Earth's first major misfortunes. It disrupted the flow. The uh, teaching process was postponed. Adam and Eve were worse. Now, why, w w explain the Lucifer Rebellion. How does that work? Lucifer was. I mean, he's always thought of in that regard as like what we consider the devil. The devil. Okay, right. Well, if, why don't you explain your understanding of it? Well, Lucifer was more like we would refer to as a regional manager, where Satan was his assistant. Satan came to Earth and had the leaders, the teachers at Earth, participate in the rebellion. <clears throat> they, in turn, caused Earth to go into a state of quarantine, essentially. And that carried over all the way into the times of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were going to take us from that point onto the next level. As you know from the Bible, Adam and Eve erred. 
So that interrupted the second stage. The third stage, uh, Jesus really took us to. But the first two, it would be equivalent to a child missing out on both grade school and middle school. So us as humans had to take high school and essentially wing it, which we've done a very good job at. However, it was not the way things were intended to go. And why didn't they go the way they were intended to go? What, what, what Did, happened in between here and there? Well, it, it would really require going into a lot more than an hour discussion, but um, suffice it to say, the flow was interrupted. <clears throat> that um, the teaching process was delayed and it was just, um, essentially, imagine going to school, for example, and have the school burned down. There was no other school to go to, so everyone was just, was sent home. And, and so, I mean, has the process been picked up now? I mean, are we getting back on track? I mean, does that seem to be what your experience is? It, we're, we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. We're really governed by organized religion, which is doing a great job in many respects. However, we are very fond of ceremony, and uh, that is not a problem in and of itself if everything is correct. Uh, everyone that believes in the Bible also believes that it's not completely accurate that there's other things to learn. Well, the Urantia book, which is where I get most of my information from in the second book, fills in the blanks, literally. Uh, there's not a lot left to the imagination once you cover this book because it covers everything in grand detail. Now, what makes you think that this book is accurate? Well, it's like anything else. You are called upon at some point in time to believe and you will hear two versions of the same story, yet one of them seems a lot more true, one feels more correct than the other. I can only say for me personally, the Urantia book feels true. And so, but it's, it's things that, can they be experienced? Because they're, they're like ideas, they're theories, they're concepts in a way, Correct. right? <clears throat> but they really can't be experienced. Um, they, they can be experienced per se, insofar as you, develop a greater sense of being, uh, you understand how the machine works now. You have greater insight to the Creator and His creations. Uh, you understand what Earth has gone through and it gives you a greater appreciation of why we're, as some, as some feel, dysfunctional. And it, for me personally, has motivated me to try to be a better person, to contribute to mankind as a whole because of our unfortunate past. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it applies for the part about life after death, I have absolutely no fear of death. It uh, will take you through the steps, essentially, from death of the mortal body, the human body, and give you insight to the direction we're heading. Of course, each individual is going to be different, so it's not going to apply equally across the board. So. Would you say the Urantia books, in your experience, explain all the, ne the phenomenon that people look at it as inexplicable? I think it explains what most, I try to cover what I hope most people are interested in. And it does a very elaborate job of explaining. I try to simplify it because most people are not as hungry for all the detail that I happen to be. So I take what I hope is what most people are interested in and, and water it down, if you will. Uh, not, to de not to demean it, but just to make it easier for the average person to understand. So, I mean, do you see, uh, Simon said, three and four, and eight? <laughs> is that going to be like the Hardy Boys <laughs> series, as I, Simon I, said? I honestly don't think so, because the first, it's, it's really all I wanted to do. The first was to introduce people to spirituality, give them a a sense of another group of ideas on how to go through life. Things that I've found and others have found to make life easier, more, more uh, enjoyable. And that was the first book. The second book is to explain and to give a possible explanation of the universe, if you will. Who God is, who Jesus was, what happens when we die, 
things that the planet has experienced over the course of many, many thousands of years as, since mankind has been around. Okay, well, maybe what we'll do is we'll come back and find out in the next section who God is and who Jesus is in case people are interested in that. And now maybe we'll go to the, uh, the second mantra set and uh, Mantram is going to do Maha Mantram and it's going to be performed by them and you heard them before so you know how fantastic they are. So whenever they're ready, Before we play the Maha Mantra, which is the great mantra that was given thousands of years ago, traditionally in India, um, people when they leave their bodies, they try to go up to Kashi, outside of Banaras, hopefully that Lord Shiva will say the Maha Mantra in their ear as they leave their body so that they can attain liberation. The Maha Mantra consists of 16 names of the Lord. And um, two years ago in Poland, it was given to me in a meditation to record this as the last song for the Mantram album that we have, that we did over there. And so this great Maha Mantra we do in three sections. Um, and we end with the Sai Gayatri Mantra and also with the Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavatu, which is basically wishing that there's happiness in all the heaven worlds and all the worlds here on earth because people are seeking happiness and peace within their lives and and we believe that through the names of the Lord it can bring happiness and peace. I'd like to introduce our players. From Boulder, Colorado, we have Jeff Lip K on top. And from the Philippines we have Sham Reyes. And on the keyboards we have an extraordinary young man named Surya Vadafasina. And also um, I'd like to introduce our organist and beautiful lead vocalist here, Radha Bhattavasena. Namaste.
Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you. I don't know what you guys out there are feeling, but the uh, vibration on the set is really high right now. So we're back on the set with Ken. So well, before we left for months from set, we were talking about you going to explain to us who God was and who Jesus was and how all that helps you know who you are. <laughs> I think that's really the key. Well, who Jesus was is not easy to explain, per se. Um, suffice it to say, he came to Earth to try to demonstrate the love and patience of, of God the Father. He came to live among, as man to understand man. So, in course of doing this, he wanted to demonstrate how God felt about man, and he, that's why he would always show patience and compassion and understanding and cooperation with everyone that he met. He would always be nurturing. And this is the point he was trying to make is this is how God is. He, he's all loving, he's all caring, that he is willing to do whatever it takes to demonstrate this as he had by living among men and to through his behavior, his personality, show that God is all loving, all caring. And so, and how does this help each human being to know these particular facts? How does it help them know who they are? I mean, in, in essence, are we different than Jesus? Are we different than Krishna? Would you say? No, I think we're only we're unique in a, that we have our own personality. But no, we all belong to a the universal family, if you will. And knowing this is difficult to say how it's going to affect each individual. With me personally, it just gave me a greater sense of belonging, if you will, and understanding how everything ties together. And that is really all I was personally seeking. I don't know if everyone is seeking every, the same thing. I think everyone wants to feel like they belong, they want to feel like they're part of something that is great. I think they are, everyone wants to feel love and cooperation, a family unit, if you will. And that is what I came away from all the studying. And that's what I try to give to people in the course of the two books, uh, to help them through information and tools develop a greater sense of belonging and cooperation with others. And so do you find that when you do workshops and things like that, that you know people are coming to, to have that experience, to, to be available for that? I think people are looking for something greater. Um, the material doesn't cut it for very long. It loses its luster, and I think people are looking in, within themselves. You mean the material meaning? Uh, just toys, if, uh, things you can go to the store and buy. Mm -hmm. the, Money, fame. Exactly. Cars, houses. Things that we associate ego mm -hmm. with. Um, it has a limited lifespan, whereas spirituality, it's something that you can have 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It doesn't lose it's, it's kind of luster. Like tech support, 24 seven. There you go. <laughs> it doesn't lose its luster. It, it's always there, and it just keeps getting better. The more mm -hmm. you give, the more you get, and that's mm -hmm. the beauty of it. And it's free. And. I think that as people learn that more and more, and the young seem to be seeking it uh, as much or more than their uh, their parents. And why do you think that is? I think they see their parents very confused. I think they, they, they're looking for something greater. They see what their parents are doing to the, the planet and to each other. Uh, one third of children in America are being raised by a single parent, and I think in their innocence, they sense something larger and they're seeking it out. So you find that the people who are reading your book are more younger than the older? I think it covers the whole spectrum. I think it's when people reach, as they refer to, hit bottom. I think when they said, okay, this is not working anymore. I have to find something larger. I'm looking for a greater meaning in my life. I'm looking for life to be more enjoyable. That's when they turn to my book and other books to seek this because Apparently, I have learned something through, in my experiences in reading other authors, I found something that works. And 
that is what everyone is seeking, something that they can incorporate into their day-to-day -day life to make it more pleasurable. And, and so how would you describe what works for you? I mean, you know, like, so if people are watching the show, what can they take away that this works, that this path, you know, I mean, we've had people on to talk about meditation, we've had uh -huh. people talk about like this spiritual teacher, or that spiritual teacher, so how would you describe your path, so to speak? I, for me personally, I just, I don't take life too seriously. I recognize that every experience is nothing more than a lesson, that there's always something to learn and I we are learning machines from day one so I don't leave any stone unturned I'm always looking for the next experience I'm always looking for the next opportunity to learn to make me a better person. and learn and learn what anything uh, anything yeah really I am I don't limit myself to any particular topic or any particular hobby I so is out. learning with the intellect or learning with the heart or, or both or how, how do you how do you proceed on that? Uh, learning I guess could be substituted for experiencing uh, because yes you can learn intellectually however the, the experiencing just going out into nature doing nothing is an experience you just learned a greater appreciation for what's around you you get a better sense of the delicate balance of nature and learn to be more frugal in your in waste and try to do what little part you can in extending the life of the planet because it's, it's in great danger so that is a learning to develop a greater appreciation by experiencing it so it's not a textbook learning per se it's just learning how to work together with the environment and with others, uh, considering their point of view, uh, that maybe they have a better way than you. And the only way to do that is to put ego aside and says, well, it's possible that they have a uh, more productive approach to this. Let me see how they do it. They being? They being anyone, anyone you meet, uh, everyone you meet. Uh, no one person has all the answers. So that means that we turn to each other for answers and um, ideas. Mm -hmm. So would you say in order to really hear somebody else you have to like be quiet inside, you have to be learn how to be a listener? I mean if you're talking exactly. all the time it's hard to... <laughs> yeah, hence, hence the thing, that's why you have two ears and one mouth. You should listen, uh, listen, listen more. twice as much. And so is that, is, that, is that something that somebody can learn or is it just something that you just start trying to do? Well it's part of probably the, the hardest lesson we all have to learn which is patience. Uh, we live in a world where you push buttons and things disappear. Uh, patience is in short supply. Uh, in people that, that have been studying spirituality, meditation, as, as you had pointed out uh, earlier, is one approach to develop greater patience. And it's, it's all about discipline and it's all about desire. And part of that desire and discipline is stemmed from wanting to become a better person, a greater person, to feel more connected to a higher power, if you will. And, 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 and all the things that you've been talking about feed that, feed that desire, feed that wanting to experience more, and then the, the path opens up to you as the desire expands, is that the way? I would agree. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, because uh, when the teacher, when the student is ready, the teacher will come, is one of the cliches. And when you want something or when you start working towards something, there seems to be a set of coincidences and good luck happenings that aid you in getting to that point B. Would you say that if your intention is pure, if your intention is, or any, any intention? Well, it seems to be, but um, I try to focus on the positive. So you think any intention can gain momentum just by your intention? I think if someone wanted to do if they set out to do something, they will find a way and they will find others, if necessary, to participate in it. And that can be both for good and evil, as uh, we see many examples of both. So in, in your experience, there is such a thing as good and evil? Oh, absolutely. There is? Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, and so, and how, how would you break that down? Well, I guess good and evil is a vague term per se, but we all agree that certain acts and behaviors 
are not very becoming. They're not productive to the overall harmony of mankind. The most uh, recent, well, I say recent, uh, Columbine High School not, would not be considered a, a good act. Uh, many would consider it evil. It's one example, and obviously an example of the good in mankind is being demonstrated in Turkey, as you led the show with. There's people that are taking the time, flying from other countries, to help people they never heard of, never known. But it's the the love and the desire to contribute. So would you say that evil, the way, we, the way you just described it, is a misunderstanding of the nature of of love, of what we're all made of, of our true connection? I guess it would, we think in duality. We got good and we got evil. We got God do we and have the to, devil. Do we have to think in duality? No, but it seems to be our mode more than anything. Do you think that mode is changing? Because I don't really mostly think in duality. And I know that spending time with you, you don't. So why do you think that, that that's not changing and we're, we're more coming into an experience of the one? I think it's slow but it, it is working that way. It's just, we, we like reference. So we use duality for reference. Um, if it's not right, it's wrong. If it's not fast, it's slow. And we use that to, to guide us down the path. Only if we define things. Now, at some point, you don't have to define anything. You're just living it. So right. it's not either fast or slow. It is what it is. Right? I mean, because there is no reference point. We've moved beyond a reference point. You see, to me, it's like that's where we're going. I mean, you know, then that's right. what your books are about, is coming into that experience where there, the reference point is the infinite. Our reference point is love. Our right. reference point, you know, I mean, which has no reference point. I'm just using words. But. Exactly. But like anything else, you can walk, obviously. Well, at one time, you know, it started off crawling. It's, it's all about... Uh, growing. It's so, yes, the oneness that you feel, the harmony, the simplicity that you now experience was not always there. Obviously, it's one lesson at a time, one experience at a time. And that's what the, the books are all about, especially the first one. It's, it's all about ways of approaching it. It's not, I'm not saying it's the way, but it's a way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it gives people tools to, to use. Uh, I can give you a hammer and saw etc. And you can build a house, someone else will build a different house. It's just tools that you use to do two different things. They're both houses, which is the punchline. We're all working toward a goal. We're all on a different path. You and I do things differently, but we're all working for an ultimate good, a point that you and I choose. I wanted a lot of detail about God and the universe. I studied the Urantia book. I shared that. Many people don't care for that much information. They don't. They're not concerned about that type of detail. Mm -hmm. For those that are, the book's available. If mm -hmm. not, and and you find that that increases an experience. I mean, it, it, for me it, personally. Yeah, for you personally, and for people you've spoken to who've read the book, that it really does touch them. Another. I mean, see, the intellect to me is in some way limited, unless it, like, you know, I would describe it as dropped down. Agreed. You know, drop into the heart because the heart is a collab. You know, the mind can't collaborate because it lives in duality. Sure. The heart is one, and in that you can collaborate without ego. The mind will never get around. Sooner or later, it'll get back to, I am yeah. I, Correct. I am me. You know, and I mean mine, and the whole rest of the ugly yeah. truth. Yeah, intellectually, will always be uncertain. And with spirituality, you're always certain. And that's what you and I and many, so many others have experienced, is spirituality, trying to make that connection and having that relationship with the Creator, whatever name you want to apply to Him. That is what it's all about. That is when you feel the ultimate sense of harmony and connection. And in that, the duality kind of like fades into the one. And, that's, and, and in that experience, we really do feel connected and we really do feel all one family and all love and that ultimately is what your books are about and what you hope to people to come out of those books with that experience rather than an idea of that experience. That would be ideal. Uh, if someone could, through my books, experience that. Um, That'd be fun. Yeah, <laughs> mission accomplished, but uh, I think that that may be asking a lot. I'd love to think that could happen. I think that the journey 
happens over a course of a lifetime. It's not going to happen in a few hours reading a book. I really don't. But it has to be applied. Uh -huh. It could be a, a propellant in a sense or a stepping stone. A stepping stone. Certainly. Well, I guess, you know, as we normally do at this time, uh, you know, we're coming to the end of the show and I just wanted to, you know, thank Ken and Mantram and, you know, it's just been an extraordinary experience for us here in the studio and also I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved. In the last month or so, we've, we've gotten on, Bridging Heaven Earth has gotten on in, in Boston, Atlanta, in Kauai, in Woodland Hills, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in Oxnard, and every one of those places, someone has come forth and said, I want to help bring that energy and bring that love and bring that experience to my city. And to each of those people, I mean, I don't think we have time now to name them all. It's just thank you, because that's what this show is about, and that's what we're all here to do. And that's why people fly in from, from Cincinnati, and that's why it's all about love. So please, good night. Thank you. God bless you.